Hello, and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at Answers in Genesis Canada again, and in this video Calvin Smith attempts to explain why the Bible's timeline is more trustworthy than radiometric dating. Which should be interesting given how much non-radiometric corroboration there is for timelines that have been arrived at through radiometric dating, while the timeline in the Bible contradicts basically any other timeline you could possibly come up with using any other method, including genealogy mapping with other religious texts. So I'm expecting a lot of corroborating support in favor of the biblical genealogy, along with evidence that radiometric dating is fundamentally flawed. Not just a couple of niche scenarios where radiometric dating looks anomalous, therefore the only other option must be the Bible. So let's see! And what we're going to be covering here today is the concept of date doctoring, and why you can trust the Bible's timeline versus the radiometric dating methods that we so often hear about that people use to attempt to undermine the trustworthiness of the Bible's timeline. That's not what the purpose of radiometric dating is. You guys just have to run your persecution narrative where you think that the only reason anyone could possibly come to a different conclusion from yours is because they are actively trying to disprove yours. But that's not it. I guarantee that the vast majority of people who work in scientific fields that require the dating of materials don't even think passingly about creationism when doing their work. They just do their work and report the results that they arrive at through their work without even realizing that their results anger creationist think tanks. Sir Isaac Newton famously said, Atheism is so senseless and odious to mankind that it never had many professors. Yeah, Newton said a lot of stuff about how obvious he thought it was that God exists. I'd imagine that Stephen Hawking would be of roughly equivalent intelligence as Isaac Newton, and he said, it is not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. So I guess we're equal? No, actually if we're being fair, Hawking had access to a lot more scientific data than Newton did, so he was drawing his conclusion from a much more robust data set, which means that all else being equal, Hawkins' opinion on the matter should take precedence, right? Now, unlike today, where you can practically trip trip over three atheists, so, you know, just on your way to the, the supermarket. Think of how gross this would be if it were directed toward any other religious group. Oh, person X from centuries ago called Islam a senseless and odious, but today you can practically trip over three Muslims on your way to the grocery store. I actually debated about keeping this line in the video because even saying it as a way of drawing a comparison to how gross he's being feels like it's crossing a line because it's so gross. And yet he can say that as an offhanded almost joke directed at atheists with definite undertones of seriousness where it's clear that he has contempt for our very existence. And I doubt that it even crossed his mind that anyone might find that to be disrespectful. But. They do want to have the appearance of being respectful. As of this writing, just 15 hours ago they tweeted out an article that was written in 2015 about how important it is to be respectful while engaging with atheists, even if they are being hostile. If this is Calvin being respectful, then I don't want to see his disrespect. At the time when Sir Isaac Newton um, penned this, who by the way, uh, he's often quoted as the most famous and influential scientist who's ever lived. Highly debatable. He certainly was quite famous and influential, but most famous and influential might be pushing it. And on top of that, being a famous and influential scientist is completely irrelevant when talking about the non-scientific matter of the existence of God. And yes, the existence of God is a non-scientific question. In order to fall into the realm of science, you need to first be able to lay out exactly what will falsify God as an hypothesis. Apologists seem rather reluctant to do this, usually resorting to post hoc absurdities. Like that one, I forget which apologist said it, but they suggested that the universe not being made of green slimy triangles is proof of God, suggesting that it would falsify God if the universe was made of green slimy triangles. My point is, there is nothing concrete that can be put forward that apologists would accept as falsifying God, so the God hypothesis cannot be tested, and so is unscientific. As such, what one of the greatest scientific minds of history thinks of the God hypothesis 
is rather irrelevant. Though you do often find apologetic arguments for God lying in the scientific unknowns. For Newton, that was the orbit of Mercury. It didn't fit his calculations like everything else did, so he gave up and credited God with keeping it where it should be. Then Einstein came along and figured out relativity, which took that gap away from God. The fact that as we learn more about how the universe works, the proportion of religious scientists gets smaller indicates that God is not a necessary explanation for anything. At the time Newton penned this in the mid-1600s, it was a very true statement. You see, when you think about the concept of atheism as a whole, a system of belief where practically everything is meaningless. Meaning is irrelevant. We are looking for truth. If the truth is that there is no ultimate meaning to anything, then that is the truth, even if you don't like it. Because our very existence is thought to have been brought about with no purpose or direction, it is an extremely odious uh, concept. Why? I get to choose the meaning of my life for myself. I don't have to make my life about sucking God's dick all day every day. I can decide to do what is important to me, and since this is the only life that we get, I am more motivated to try and make a positive difference in the lives of those around me than I would be if I thought that they would all get eternal paradise when they die anyway, so who cares if this life is a bit painful for them? How is this in any way odious? That is, my view that I should try and make a positive difference in the lives of those around me, not the view that they get paradise later, so who cares if their life sucks now. Because that one's pretty odious. It, because there can't be any true meaning to anything at all. You see, in this worldview, someday uh, you and I will die, our kids will die, their kids will die, and eventually the whole universe will reach heat death and die. So? What does that have to do with my life in the here and now? Why do apologists refuse to acknowledge the inherent value in experiences as we have them in the only life that can be demonstrated to exist? And what does any of this have to do with radiometric dating? However, for the unrepentant sinner, there is kind of a silver lining behind this worldview. It's the assumption that there's no judgment. Ah yes, of course, the I'm only an atheist because I want to sin gambit. Sorry, Calvin, but I lead way too boring a life for that to be the case. You see, a moral law requires a moral lawgiver. And with the concept that there is no God comes the freedom of belief that no matter what we do in life, no matter how, you know, evil our thoughts and deeds, if we are somehow able to get away with it, then we actually get away with it. Who is the person who gets away with it? The person who tries their best for their whole lives to be a good person, making the lives of those around them better to the best of their ability, but because they don't believe in Jesus they end up going to hell for eternity, or the person who's a piece of shit human who makes people miserable, works only for their own gain at the expense of others, cheats, steals, lies, all that stuff, and then converts to Christianity moments before death and so goes to heaven and is rewarded with eternal paradise. I'd say the bad person who ended up in heaven got away with a lot more, wouldn't you? So similarly the, the, uh, to the example of getting children to take something they wouldn't normally want, you know, a little bit of sugar, secular thinkers in the 1800s understood that in order to sway people over to accept their naturalistic worldview, they'd need to dress it up a bit and make it more feasible and more attractive. Again, you're assuming motives for people that just were not motivated that way. Scientific progress is not the result of a shady group of conspirators trying to figure out how to disprove creationism. Scientific progress just happens as scientists learn more about how stuff works. The fact that it disproved creationism in the process was merely a result of creationism not being true, not malicious intent on the part of the scientists. In order for someone to accept atheism, they've got to believe that everything they see around them has somehow come about by random processes. Not random, just non-directed. Something doesn't need to be consciously directed in order to not be random. The fact that it snows only when it's cold out is not because of random chance, it's the result of several factors, the most obvious here being the freezing point of water. So snow happening when it's cold is neither the result of random chance or direction. And in order to replace the idea for a creator god, um, in order for that to have happened, it's reasonable to assume that the, the universe did, just didn't pop into existence fully formed and functional the way that we experience it today. The only people I've ever seen make that claim 
are creationists who don't even properly understand the creationist arguments. And so they find themselves arguing against the idea that the Earth came into existence at the Big Bang, which is not actually something that anyone proposes. So the concept of millions of year, years of Earth history being a fact was crucial in establishing a naturalistic worldview among the populace in the West. It's like you think the normal process of scientific discovery is just some massive propaganda campaign, which is a really weird way to view science, especially since science actually produces tangible results. Kind of like a like an image consultant or, or a date doctor whose job it is to help their clients look their best while hiding their worst features. The concept of long ages was popularized by emphasizing its supposed, you know, kind of innocuous effect on the on the dominant Christian worldview of the day. Citation needed there, buddy. Charles Lyell, the geologist who was largely responsible for popularizing ancient ages and uniformitarianism, actually had a really hard time accepting evolution when Darwin proposed it because he saw it as conflicting with his deeply held Christian faith. But sure, he was secretly working to undermine Christianity the whole time. Today, the majority of people assume that the Earth is billions of years old often because they think that dating methods like radioisotope or radiometric calculations, well, they're foolproof. They are not foolproof, as is demonstrated by creationists constantly sending samples off to labs to be dated with methods that are inappropriate for their samples, so that they might see the obviously inaccurate results that they get when the samples are dated incorrectly, and then proclaim from the mountaintops how inaccurate radiometric dating is, because when you use it wrong, you get the wrong answer. Radiometric dating was developed in the early 20th century, and it's considered by mainstream scientists and laypersons alike as very reliable for measuring absolute ages of rocks and hence the Earth. And generally it is. Obviously things like sample quality will have an impact on how reliable your results are, which is one of the reasons samples are often subjected to multiple dating methods. This is particularly true for things like ice cores, which sometimes undergo ridiculous amounts of cross-reference dating. One of the Greenland ice cores was dated using 42 independent methods. Everything from counting layers to oxygen isotope analysis to carbon-14 to calibrating layers with events of known ages and more. So when the majority of these 42 dating methods, all of which have their own independent strengths and weaknesses, agree that a sample is a certain age, can we not be reasonably certain that the sample is indeed that age? If all of the dating methods had some fatal flaws, then because of how differently they operate, they should come to different conclusions, with the different flaws having different effects on the results. The amount of agreement that we see with them is such that the only real conclusion to be drawn that doesn't rely on magic is that the date is correct within a certain margin of error. But is there really a reliable direct way to determine the absolute age of any fossil or rock or the Earth? Yes. Well, contrary to the widespread belief that there is, actually no such method exists. I mean, if you closely examine specific examples of dating by this method, its proven validity falls apart really quickly. There, there is, in fact, no way to directly determine the age of any fossil or rock. Well, for fossils, generally no, at least not for fossils older than about a million years, which is the cutoff for dating samples using electron spin resonance dating. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but a summary that's oversimplified is that when something like a fossil is exposed to the sun, it excites the electrons in the material. When it is no longer being exposed, the electrons can return to their unexcited states. But some electrons get caught in the crystal lattice of the rock, and so take more time to return to their original states. A measurement of such electrons will give the amount of time it's been since the sample was last exposed to the sun, which for a fossil would usually line up with its age. But for rocks, yes, we do directly date the rocks. And for the Earth, no, we don't get the age of the Earth by directly dating Earth rocks. We determine that independently by dating things that would have formed around the same time as the Earth. So this is kind of a weird argument to make when arguing for a 6,000-year-old Earth. It essentially amounts to, well, just because you know that a meteor is 4.5 billion years old doesn't mean the Earth is. They might have formed at different times. Therefore, the whole universe is 6,000 years old. Do you not see how the existence of stuff that is older than the universe kind of falsifies the creationist hypothesis even if we don't directly date the Earth? Now, if you think that's overstating, consider this. For example, the revised age of the Earth, according to the latest radioactive dating, is 4.55 billion and 4.6 billion years old. 
I'm not entirely sure where you're getting those numbers, as I'm finding 4.543 billion years old, but at least you're in the right order of magnitude this time, and you're even pretty close to being within the error bars. It's 4.543 billion years old, plus or minus 50 million years. So I guess I can grant that? Now that alone represents a considerable gap of, of 50 million years. Yes. So wait, are you saying that they revised it down from 4.6 to 4.55? Or are you saying they revised it up from 4.55 to 4.6? Or are you saying that the actual age is somewhere in that range and that represents the error bars? I'm not sure you're not really being clear on this, but I think you're just complaining that the number changed at some point. Which, you know, that's typical for creationists. They don't understand that the ability to revise your position based on new information is actually a good thing. But anyway, yes, there are error bars on that number of 50 million years, which is a long ass time to us, but geologically it's pretty short. Remember, when creationists talk about the Cambrian explosion, suddenly 50 million years is the equivalent of immediately at the same moment in time. The error bars are unlikely to get much smaller than that because the formation of the solar system was a process that took about 50 million years, though we are pretty sure that the smaller rocky planets, like the Earth, would have been some of the last objects to form. It isn't an absolute age for the Earth at all, and although some may see this fudge factor as acceptable to the big picture, it can make the you know, astute thinker realize there's legitimate room for real doubt regarding these methods. Error bars exist on any scientific measurement or calculation. That doesn't make it not an absolute age. And if science really operated the way you described, with scientists and researchers desperately trying to disprove creationism with everything they do without worrying about actually being accurate, then they wouldn't even bother providing error bars. The error bars leave room for future discoveries to pin down the number to an even greater degree, with scientists now being aware of the limitations and representing those limitations in their work. Unfortunately, evolutionary scientists, including Old Earth Christian geologists, fully embrace these methods like VARV or tree ring chronology and uh, carbon dating. Wait, why are you bringing up VARV and tree ring chronologies? I thought we were talking about the age of the Earth here. Dendrochronology is one of the most accurate chronologies we have. VARV chronology is similar to ice cores, it's glacial sediment cores usually from lake bottoms. Varv chronologies are also very reliable, and can sometimes even get you down to the season level rather than the year level, with different seasons leaving different marks in the Varv. Neither Varv chronology nor dendrochronology get us back to the age of the Earth though, so I'm not sure why they're being brought up in the context of this discussion. As proven dating methods, but often ignore the glaring, but often little known weaknesses that these methods have. They don't ignore them, they account for them in their work. Since you mentioned tree ring chronology, or dendrochronology to use the technical term, at the same time as carbon dating, now is actually a good time to point out that dendrochronology is actually used to calibrate the carbon curve for carbon dating, giving us a way to directly measure the carbon composition of the atmosphere in specific years, thereby allowing us to adjust the carbon dates, taking into account the fact that carbon-14 levels in the atmosphere cannot be assumed to be stable throughout time. Dendrochronology itself has some known issues, but again, these issues are accounted for in their work. Such issues include the varying reliability for tree ring generation in different species. Some species of trees aren't even used for dendrochronology because they are known to vary wildly in how many rings are produced in a season. But other species, like oak, are not known to have ever had a missing ring. Alder and pine are known to occasionally skip a year and occasionally double up in a year. And skipped years and doubled up years also leave visible markers. The rings have different characteristics from a normal ring. And such doubling up or missing is a result of specific weather patterns, which are patterns that deviate from the norm. So even if dendrochronologists miss the rings and count each one as one year while not noticing the missing rings or the doubled up rings, the measurement error that that would cause would be comparatively slight. Next he gives a summary of how radiometric dating generally works, and aside from a few spots where he phrases it to sound like there's more doubt about the process than there actually is, he does a decent job of it. So I'm skipping that, and if you don't already know the basics of radiometric dating, then go ahead and give my video on the various dating methods a watch before continuing. Now, by assuming the starting amount, how long it takes for the material to decay, and how much is present in the sample being examined, this provides a way for scientists to assume how old a material is. See, again, you're acting as though they are working to make stuff look older than it actually is. 
they aren't. There are ways of testing these assumptions, like what I mentioned before about using multiple different methods on the same sample. Because the parameters required for radiometric dating are different for each different method, if there was a problem with the date, or with the assumptions in the dating method, then the dating methods would yield different results. And that's to say nothing of isochron dating, which, again, if you're not familiar with it, it's a hard one to summarize quickly, so go watch the dating methods video. But long story short, isochron dating uses the ratios of parent to daughter isotopes and their ratios with the non-radiogenic isotopes of the same element of the daughter in order to determine whether or not there has been contamination, or if there were daughter isotopes already present when the rock formed, etc. The degree to which all these different dating methods agree with each other is such that it leaves us with two options. Either they actually work the way we think they work, or God purposely tinkered with the decay rates of the various elements tweaking each of them to a different degree in order to make them appear to agree with each other rather than leaving them as obviously wildly inaccurate. So either they work, or God is a deceptive trickster. However, it's important to understand something. Rocks aren't clocks. What they're measuring is not an, an absolute dates here. I mean, if we're being overly technical with our definitions, no, it's not absolute. And since science is overly technical in nature, there are actually a number of scientists who are advocating to change the name from absolute dating to chronometric dating in order to avoid the appearance of undue certainty. But not being absolute in that sense does not mean that it's inaccurate to the degree required to make young Earth creation plausible. I mean, really, for young Earth creationism to be plausible, we have to ignore a lot more than just radiometric dating. Pretty much all of geology has to go out the window. And paleontology. Anthropology, biology, a sizable chunk of astronomy. Science. You have to throw out most of modern science in order for young Earth creation to be true. Hence the range and the supposed age of the Earth. Yes, we are aware of our limitations, and so don't overrepresent how sure we are of our conclusions, so we give an age of the Earth with error bars to account for these limitations. But again, I would like to stress that the range given for the potential age of the Earth is about 5 million years shorter than the Cambrian, and creationists, including Answers in Genesis, just love pointing out how quickly things developed in the Cambrian. So make up your mind. Is 50 million years a long time, or an instant? but they're measuring ratios, and the dates have to be inferred based on assumptions about those ratios. No, the dates are calculated based on those ratios, and the assumptions aren't as assumptive as you're making them out to be. The samples are meticulously examined for features that would be indicative of contamination, like microfractures. They are often dated with multiple methods. Details about the location that they were collected from are meticulously recorded, etc., etc., etc. So it's vital to understand that the assumptions about the facts that we observe, the rocks and fossils, rather than the facts themselves, are the key to how these dating methods operate. No, the facts themselves are the key. The assumptions are merely the lubricant that allows the lock to turn easily. Since we're not able to go back in time and witness rocks or fossils being formed, or, or see the decay rates of the atoms at the time when the Earth was created. We have been measuring decay rates since the beginning of the 20th century, and we have never observed a change in them that isn't accounted for by measurement error. Answers in Genesis sure does like to suggest that the decay rates were different in the past, but they bring no evidence to the table to support this claim, while more than a century of direct measurement have never seen a change. And like I said before, if they did change, then they all had to change by different amounts so that when we discovered them, they all appear to be in agreement about the ages of all the stuff that we date with them. So that doesn't just mean a universal change in decay rate for, say, rubidium as a whole. That would be a different change in the decay rate for rubidium in this sample than in that other sample. So that not only would it agree with the other dating methods, it would be consistent with the appearance of uniformitarianism all throughout the geologic record. If God did that, he's a dick. Pretend you want to know how quickly a normal wax candle will burn away. So you set up an experiment, you've got a candle, it's 12 inches high, and you light it. Now let's say for our, our analogy that we notice that every hour, okay, on the clock, out one inch of the candle melts away. So from the data you've collected, you determine that the decay rate of the candle is in fact one inch per hour. Now, let's say you walk into a room. Now you've never been in the room before and you see a burning candle and it's six inches tall. Can you assume that you can know how long it's been burning? 
I mean, most people would say, yeah, based on the data, data collected earlier, that yes, you can know with confidence that the candle has been burning for six hours. Your analogy isn't complete, so let's try to fix it. First, this isn't the first room we've walked into. Second, there are other objects in the room that dissipate at different known rates. So, for instance, there might be an ice cube melting in the room as well. And we know that rooms that have the properties that this room has typically start with 12-inch candles, and this happens as a result of the laws of physics rather than the whims of the builders. And we know with similar certainty the initial size of the ice cube. And we have other rooms to examine, which we have good reason to believe that they were built in a specific order, and all the candles within those rooms fit into that build order perfectly, and they all have ice cubes that also corroborate the build order. You are constricting the amount of data that we have in order that you might exaggerate the possibility that any one assumption could be catastrophically wrong, but when you take the data as a whole, there is way too much to deny that there is validity to the dating method, and the error bars are reasonably small. What, what if the candle had been lit 10 years ago, burned for a little while, then someone snuffed it out, and it had been relit just five minutes before you walked into the room? Well, in this analogy, it would be God snuffing it out and relighting it, wouldn't it? And he made sure to snuff out all the other candles in all the other rooms at different times in order that it might appear that the rooms were built in the order that they look like they were built in, when in reality they were all built simultaneously. And then he relit all the candles based on when he knew we would enter the various rooms in order that he might trick us into seeing that the candle data matches the data from the order in which it looks like the rooms were built, which also matches the ice cube data that I guess he managed to manipulate by changing the thermostat in a similar but slightly different way than how he fiddled with the candles. My point is that in this analogy, this hypothetical candle snuffer outer and relighter went to a lot of work to make the data say something that just wasn't true. Those calculations could only be accurate if we knew and received data from a trusted source and or a, someone who observed the candle before it started burning and all the way through the process. Okay, so... Let's hypothetically grant everything you've said thus far. Now, please, tell me, where in the Bible does it say that the decay rates for the elements have been fluctuating wildly, thus making rocks appear to be older than they are? Where does the Bible explain why we are able to obtain an unbroken dendrochronological record that goes back to at least twice the age of the universe? Where does the Bible address the dozens of dating methods, only some of which are radiometric, that are used on ice cores that have gotten us back to hundreds of thousands of years? Millions of years in the case of the Antarctic ice cores, but that one does rely on radiometric methods, so well, I guess we can leave that one out for some reason. Does your trusted source even hint at the idea that it was even aware of any of this? No, no it does not, because the authors of the Bible were completely unaware of these things. So similar assumptions used in the candle analogy apply to all radiometric dating methods. Except, as I've pointed out, you have wildly misrepresented these assumptions and are ignoring the fact that these dating methods are often in close agreement with each other, a fact that would not be the case if they were actually not accurate. It's true that we can measure decay rates using observational science. And it's true that we have never measured them to be any different than what they are still measured as today when accounting for variations in the sensitivity of the equipment being used. And it is also true that we have attempted to change the decay rates, but have not found any mechanism that can have an impact on them. It is also true that we continue to test these assumptions to see if there's anything we haven't thought of yet that might have an impact. So if you're going to suggest that they were not just different, but massively different, you need to also provide a mechanism and some experimental data to show that your hypothesis is even possible, as all of our observational science, as you like to call it, has indicated that they do not change and it's not possible for them to change. Although some people simply trust that the assumptions are correct, the chances of at least one of these four assumptions being invalid is made very obvious when we look at some of the published radiometric dates found in the scientific literature. And this is the portion of the program where he will start talking about xenoliths and lava flows, that is, rock that was contained in the lava flow but was not fully melted, and therefore will date older than the flow itself. But he won't mention xenoliths, because once you know what those are, it kind of gives away the game. Because around the world, a number of studies have been done to try to validate radiometric dating, but have failed. 
Actually, most studies that deal with the actual process of radiometric dating itself are done specifically to find the problems with the dating method so that these problems can be known and thereby accounted for. For instance, in a lot of the papers that deal with the xenoliths and lava flows, they're testing to see if argon dating works on those xenoliths, and excess argon is often detected, so we know that great care must be taken with that dating method on those types of samples. So no, scientists don't write papers attempting to prove things that are already well established, they try to rock the boat in order to give us a more robust understanding of all the factors that are at play. The fact that you seem to be unaware of this is quite telling. For example, rocks of a known age from observed events like Mount St. Helens last eruption in 1986 have been tested. And several different radiometric dating methods used uh, resulted in dates estimated at millions of years when, when we know that the rock was only 10 years old when tested through radiometric dating. And there we go. Thanks to his specifying that these samples were taken 10 years after the fact, I am able to pinpoint this to a paper by Steve Austin, the creationist geologist, not the wrestler, published in 1996. Austin sent these samples to a lab to be dated using potassium argon dating, a dating method that is accurate on samples with a minimum age of 250,000 years. And that is with excellent samples and state-of-the-art equipment. The lab that Austin chose to send his samples to was advertising at the time that they could not accurately date samples that were younger than 2 million years old. So, when dated with a dating method that is known to not be applicable to young samples, the rocks gave anomalous ages. Austin also flat out admitted in the paper that the samples were not homogenous, that is, they contained xenocrysts, old material that had not completely melted in the flow. Those xenocrysts would naturally contaminate the sample, making it appear older overall than it actually was. So your example of radiometric dating not working is from a time when a creationist sent an impure contaminated sample to a lab for a dating method that was known to not work on rocks that young, and it came out with the wrong age. Well, duh. That's why real scientists actually work to challenge radiometric dating methods, so that we know how to avoid situations like this one. Also, fun fact, but if you've been following my channel for a while, you may remember a video from a couple years ago where I mentioned a table of data where a creationist researcher copied data from the wrong column of a table in another paper into a table in his paper, and then other creationists copied the incorrect table into their papers and articles, and it remains uncorrected to this day. Well, that's this paper. Austin was copying data from a table in a paper that was studying excess argon and historic lava flows, and mistakenly copied the amount of excess argon into his paper as the measured age. This is the kind of basic mistake that would normally be caught by the peer review process, but as creationists don't seem to care much for the scientific method, it has not only passed their peer review process, it has remained uncorrected on at least four creationist webpages that are still available today 26 years later. Also, the north rim of the Grand Canyon, while well, it's got lava flows from volcanoes on it that erupted after its formation, which potassium argon dating methods have determined are a billion years older than the oldest rocks at the bottom of the canyon are supposed to be. Well, that would certainly be interesting. The basement rocks are already over 1.3 billion years old, so to find a 2.3 billion year old lava flow would be fascinating indeed. But I can't actually find any corroboration for this claim, not even from creationist sites. I did find an Institute for Creation Research article that provided a reference that gave a date for a lava flow that originated in the Unkar group, one of the oldest groups of rocks in the Grand Canyon. So that lava dating older than the top lip of the Grand Canyon does make perfect sense, and the radiometric dates that are calculated for that lava flow fit in perfectly with its location in the Grand Canyon. Now, I did eventually find another Steve Austin article talking about getting a 1.3 billion year age for a lava flow that is supposed to be 1.2 million years old, so that's probably what you're referring to because it's a billion years older than it should be. It's not a billion years older than the basement rocks, though. In this instance, this is another paper by Austin, he used isochron dating, which is supposed to take care of contamination issues, right? Right. And Austin's isochron diagram is correct. The date he arrived at appears to be accurate, 1.3 billion years old. So how is that possible in a lava flow that is only 1.2 million years old? Well, Austin didn't collect his samples in a way that would lead to an accurate date for that lava flow. Notably, the four samples he used were from four different lava flows of different ages. So wait, 
If he used samples from different lava flows, how did the isochron dating end up being accurate? Because when multiple lava flows share a source, you can use samples from these multiple flows in order to date the source itself rather than the flow. And as a professional geologist, Austin no doubt knew this, so he gave an accurate date for the source of all four lava flows, but decided to represent it as the date for just one of the four flows. Seems intentional if you ask me. Okay, I'm done with this one now. He gives one more example that's just more of the same and then goes into summary mode. He didn't give us a single data point that would give us any reason to trust a biblical timeline over a scientific timeline. So I guess this just falls into the typical creationist thing where they assume that if they poke enough holes in the scientific model, then their model will become the accepted model by default without having to do anything to support it. <sighs> well, Homer. I guess you're the winner by default. Default! Woohoo! The two sweetest words in the English language. Default! 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 Today's comment of the day comes just from Idanthersus, who says, Who cares? Christians haven't been a problem for years. They lost the online debate over ten years ago. All the skeptic channels started doing other things years ago. Must have missed the memo. Couple things here. First, I am most definitely not the only skeptic channel that still covers religious content, there are plenty of others still out there. Second, I'm pretty sure I remember when all the big name skeptic channels started doing other things, and that's actually when I started my channel to fill in the void that they left behind. And if the Christians lost the online debate over a decade ago, nobody seems to have informed them of that fact. And finally and most importantly, if you think that Christians haven't been a problem for years, then you haven't been paying attention for years. Imagine saying that Christians haven't been a problem for years, just barely one year after the January 6th insurrection, an event that was marked by the conspicuous presence of Christian-themed flags, Bibles, public displays of faith, people praying while bowing reverently to a giant wooden cross, etc. Never mind the fact that one of the two main political parties in the most powerful nation on earth is essentially being run by Christian nationalists, with the other party afraid to call out the religious nature of the problem because they want to pander to their more liberal religious base, even if they aren't religious themselves, which a lot of them still are. But sure, Christians have been totally cowed by the online religious debate and wouldn't dare try anything funny against the people who they lost the debate to, right? Now of course this doesn't apply universally, I am in no way saying that all Christians support the actions of the people on January 6th, but to ignore the role that the religion of Christianity plays in events like that is just to be turning a blind eye to the obvious. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, iOS Tilt Bill Gamer, Bryn Pound, Clench Eastwood, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, Mark Hetchum, and all the rest, who are the candle burning in the sealed room that is my channel. If you'd like to only be a tiny portion of an accurate analogy for radiometric dating, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist. Links to social media, all the ways to support the channel, and to my other projects can be found at links.vicerhino.com. If for whatever reason you want to send me stuff, my P.O. Box address is in the description. See you next time!